So all three of these artists are working with line and form and shape in many different ways for many different reasons. And um, where is Paul? Oh, there he is. Okay. So the first person I'm going to introduce to you tonight is Jason Montgomery. He's a Shakina, Shakana, Shakana, indigenous California poet, painter, community artist, and engagement artist from El Centro, California. Yes. Okay. He lives in East. Uh, I actually live in Hollywood now, yeah, but I work my studio in East Hampton. In East Hampton, Massachusetts. His work engages the cross section of Chicano, indigenous identity, cultural hybridization, and post colonial reconstruction and political. Agency. How about that? And he was showed in uh, Five Points some time ago when we showed Indigenous artists across the United States. He's here in New England and he has this compelling exhibition in the TDP Gallery. And welcome to you and thank you for coming back. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I thought this was way to be formal this evening. So I want to talk about Joseph Clark because that's fun. Joseph is a Connecticut-based artist, Joe, living in Litchfield County and working from his Kent studio. So the story is, I have known Joe Clark for a very long time. He showed up in one of my classes many years ago, and he can do about anything. He went on to Hartford Art School, and he graduated from there in 2018 with a bachelor's in fine arts degree, and afterwards started working as a studio assistant for somebody we'll talk about in a few minutes. Joe is amazing. He is, is, I mean, I'm so impressed with the work he has grown into, and uh, I can't wait to see the work he's going to do next. And Joe, it's especially warm for me to welcome you to Five Points. Thank you so much. And now, and now there's Power Booth. Okay, so Power Booth's uh, resume, it will blow you away. Uh, he is, um, Besides this amazing artist who is in all these exhibitions and private collections and museum collections across the United States. He is one of the warmest, kindest people you will ever meet. Power Booth is also the former dean of the Hartford Art School. He teaches now at the Hartford Art School. And early on, when we were five points, just art space in the lower gallery, and I was reaching out to artists that first summer, and. You know, I went to friends of mine and I said, you know, would you show in this gallery? You know, it's a temporary summer gallery. And many of them said to me, oh, Judy, why would I go to Five Points? And I said, because I've asked you and I've done you favors. <laughs> and so, and they said, okay. And I said, and I'm going to ask Power Booth, but I've never met before. And so I went on vacation, and for Black Island, I called Power Booth. And I said, Power, would you show in you know, this little art space gallery that first temporary summer? He said, sure. And then after that, he said to me, Judy, we can do this. We can make this work. And, and, we, and then Power joined our first board. And Power has been forever um, a, a comfort to me as we have gone through this story of the five, the five points of growth. Um, now into almost its 12th year. So, thank you, Paula. <laughs> and then I want to talk a little about Cynthia Cooper, okay? So, Cynthia Cooper has shown it both in the Annex and Five Points Gallery. She lives in, and works in Connecticut, holds a BFA in printmaking from Pennsylvania State University. I had to look that up. Okay. She is, as I know, a abstract painter. She exhibits widely in Connecticut and is nationally and has received numerous awards. I'm reading this, okay? Her work is held in private and permanent collections in the Pennsylvania State University of the New York, the New uh, Britain Museum of American Art in New Britain, Connecticut. And she is one of the warmest, kindest, most creative artists I know. And so I am we are so honored to have Cynthia Cooper monitor this talk tonight. And I thank you all again for being here. And Cynthia, it's all yours. Oh, great. I'm not going to say thank you for coming out in the rain because you people are just the normal people saying this is life and this is, it sometimes rains. It's everywhere else that's going to miss out on this. Um, one of the things that many years ago I was 
to it for an artist talk, and someone asked one of the artists, what was their biggest challenge? And the reply did not surprise me, but it surprised the audience. And the, and the artist, whom I don't remember who it was at this point, said, my biggest challenge is finding time in my studio because I have a full-time job, I have a family, I have kids, and it's really hard to do this. And there probably isn't a person in this room who isn't somehow connected to the arts or isn't an artist themselves. And you all know that when you have a day job, it's sometimes hard to drag yourself out afterwards or find a weekend or early morning or late night where you want to face that. So all three of these people have had incredible interesting jobs that take them away to do other things. And they still somehow manage to find the power, find, find it down deep inside and pull it out of them to make art that is arresting, that is always moving forward, and that is just also beautiful, really compelling and beautiful. So I want to say, okay, so Jason, I want to start with you also because your story is, I mean, I, so I have, I have this incredible um, admiration for you and how you have gotten involved in your story, but also how you have just like, okay, I'm just going to keep following this and I'm going to bring it to the attention of the world because this is an important story. And if you don't know, but you might have already read Walt Plax or spoken with him, he is an indigenous person who is also concerned about Native, uh, Native people and also the timing of things in that many years ago.
to have their language taken from them um, in an attempt to um, uh, uh, incorporate into the larger uh, culture, both in the U.S. and Canada. Um, the, the piece that you see here is called Save the Man because the actual legislation said save the man, pull and kill the Indian. That was the, the, uh, the literal idea. And so, um, and these schools were brutal. Um, they were um, really, they were run by a, a, a Jesuit uh, group, and both here in the US and in Canada, and they, they were brutal. Um, and there was allegations of abuse from the start, um, whether we're talking sexual abuse, physical abuse. Um, and, and so part of what I was doing at that point was just trying to say to people, hey, look, there's this piece of history that you need to, to know of. And as I was working on this project, that's when the first, um, it was about six weeks after I had my first exhibition of that piece that the, the graves started to be found in Canada. So um, we, we shifted. And I, I don't want to bogart the conversation, so. No, it's okay. It's just, also, tell me why the flags were orange. Um, so tomorrow, uh, September 30th, is Orange Shirt Day, both in the U.S. and Canada. Orange Shirt Day is a day that we invite everyone to wear an orange shirt as a remembrance for missing and murdered Indigenous children. Um, so tomorrow, when you wake up, please throw in an orange shirt. Um, help raise awareness of this issue that is still ongoing. Um, you know, the, the, both in the U.S. Canada has begun formal investigations into their site, and although there, there uh, it has been a commitment made, the U.S. hasn't started to actually investigation into insights, which is troubling due to the fact that a lot of the same literal people were running both both the US and the Canadian programs. So well I think exhibitions like this will bring attention and also one of the things that you had mentioned to me, tell me about the house. Tell me who was allowed to mm. when you did that exhibition and who was allowed to come and see it. So um, that was actually when we first launched this uh, this piece, because I, I exhibited this piece. What I did was I broke the house apart at that point and um, utilized pieces of, of the house in, in the first rendition of Save the Man. And I was very, um, at that point, very angry, like if I'm being completely frank with you, um, and, and very much amongst the Native community, um, particularly with individuals whose family had gone through the residential school program, um, there was this feeling of, of a lack of space to grieve. So um, I was lucky enough to be launching the, the first rendition of a space called the Map Gallery, which is in East Hampton, which is no longer exhibiting, but it had large windows and glass doors that face outward. So I locked the doors, said, no, I'm only going to allow ind individuals with indigenous and native descent um, access to the space because I didn't want to provide a catharsis um, to to individuals who maybe were seeing this on TV and needed or wanted the space to go and engage something but then not do anything. Um, that became a real important part of the idea of like to say, to say no, you know, this is our space to grieve. You can look in and I invited people to um, use pens to write on the glass to, set, to give messages to our community, um, which was Surprising some of the things that were said. Um, you know, there was a denialism, there was, you know, literally someone said get over it, which I was talking to someone earlier. Um, there was a, a fair amount of vitriols, but there was also a, a huge amount of, uh, I think, love towards our community. Um, but the idea of just saying, like, no, this is our space, um, and we are going to be here, we are going to grieve, and you're not going to be allowed in, um, was really important to that moment. A lot of, when I do pieces, they tend to change, they tend to be not, um, not be replicable uh, again and again. It's part of my, I think it's part of my theater background, if I'm being honest with you, um, that we, I, I definitely tailor work to the space that it's in, and, and here at Five Points, I wanted to provide a space that people can enter and, and, and be touched by and touch back, and um, in part because it, 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 it's such an abstraction um, from, from actual images, uh, which is very purposeful, and so the idea of being able to come in and, and feel 
the, the, the kids around you I felt was important for this particular space? Well, I think this space works beautifully. Um, I liked the feeling of being enveloped in it, and I did feel very touched, and I felt, I mean, I saw the individuals, I felt the individuals, and I could offer my condolences and respect to each individual. I think it's very great to have, a, have an art installation at, to which you don't allow people to come. Which yeah. I think that's very, um, but also very beautiful. You know, very, very beautiful. So I have to say, I really applaud your work. Thank you. And, and also, just the fact that you decided that you needed to take action. Because, you know, the rest of us sometimes sit around and say, oh, you know, that's really terrible. You know, maybe I'll send a check. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> steps that everyone can take. I mean, uh, particularly with this particular issue, you can write to the Department of Interior and demand that that action be taken. You can write to your representatives um, and demand that they take up, um, take this up and make it a point that, that an investigation is funded and investigation actually happens. Okay, so notice. Thank you so much. You're Thank you. Your work is just stunning. So I'm going to move Really, 
enormous. And um, it's talking about they're heavy because they've got lots of layers on them, including the two layers of the, the clear coat. <laughs> and um, they do look a little bit to me like crumpled automobiles. And then come to find out that four of the colors that are in that lower gallery are happen to be uh, pink colors from 1970s Jaguars. So there is a connection there. Between. Yeah, you got it. Yes. So, um, and tell me where did those Jaguar? Tell me about the Jaguar connection. Yeah. So um, back in 1970, my grandfather bought a Jaguar XKE, which is I don't know if anyone's familiar with that car. It's a beautiful car. Gorgeous. Um, and after he passed, my dad inherited the car and sort of just let it fall into disrepair. So while I was growing up, I was just seeing this car constantly, just sitting in my parents' barn and always daydreaming about how much I just wanted to fix it up and get it back on the road. Um, it's the same color as the burgundy piece that's in there. So that was the inspiration. And I just went and found a couple more colors from that same exact year, same model, and sort of ran with it. When you started this process and you were in a discovery phase, did you, I mean, did you hit upon what you're doing pretty quickly, or did you have uh, some tryouts that didn't work quite so well? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of trial and error. Um, at first, I was strictly using tension to try to keep the canvas to hold the shape, because just crumpled up canvas on its own will eventually So I tried pulling and stapling and anything I could to try to keep some sort of consistent shape. Um, but it wasn't getting that crumpled up raw effect that I had gotten initially. Um, my studio at the time happened to be directly above my father's boat making studio, where he used fiberglass and epoxy resin to build boats. So it just sort of clicked. I was like, he's solidifying cloth right below me. I think I can do this too. Um, so I started using a clear coat epoxy resin on canvas and it, yeah, it was perfect. I mean, figuring out the timing took a long time also. A lot of failed pieces, um, but fun all the way through. So when I asked him about the failed pieces, what do you do with something that's failed? Like, the first thing I would do is cut it up and make little tiny things out of it and then sell them for a hundred bucks a piece. And say, That's cool. You know? <laughs> or give them away. And he pointed to the piece that's in the middle of the floor and said, well, that's one of the failed pieces, so now it's a sculpture. And I just think that's astonishing because what a great idea. And it's also quite a beautiful, really a beautiful shape and really beautiful I mean, there's, there's, there is something about that luster and that gloss that is just, like, when you, when you go down there and you can see all the fingerprints on it because people want to touch it. Well, I want to lick it, you know? <laughs> They're just spectacular. It's They're funny. Um, that was sort of an accident, too. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. Um, yes, you are. It's okay. <laughs> I needed to get this piece I considered failed out of the way, so I took it and I draped it over my step stool. And that's exactly the same way it is down in the gallery there. I would, I would say you're always supposed to talk about that because that's a discovery. I, I think of it as a discovery, you know? Definitely. I'd make more of those if I could. I think, yeah, I yeah, want to go through more of those yeah. sculptural yeah. yeah, I could just see uh, a grouping of them out in the woods, you know, um, sculpture park, whatever. They um, do look pretty Five smart. point, you know, five points, 90 acre campus with some Dotted through, you know, hidden in the woods. Here we go. Yeah, oh, Judy likes that. Yeah. 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 So, um, there. so before you did these, did you have other processes? But it sounds as though you could have done this pretty quickly out of art school. Yeah. So during art school, I was working strictly with oil paints, and um, I was working. Trying to eliminate composition.
composition and subject matter, so it was really just form, color, and mark making, which was strictly palette making. Um, so, you know, just color relationships, repetitive motion, and doing them fast. They always needed to be done pretty quickly. Working with a singular pile of paint that just over time changed color. Um, and a lot of that has actually come through into this new body of work. Um, composition actually plays a much bigger part now than it did then. Um, now that I'm working with both the color, shine, and raw canvas, I need to sort of decide where that's going to go. Um, but they're still very fast. There's a fair amount of slow preparatory work that takes place, but the physical shaping of the pieces can be, I mean, it can happen just like that. Once I wait for that sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone, um, <laughs> yeah, it can be 15 minutes and that's it, you know, after like 12 hours of work. Well, I love the, I love the way the colors get really, really rich. They start out as nice colors to start with, but there's something about after they're folded and then you have all the shadows and you have the highlights and you have that damn gloss, which again, I want to lick. Um, it's just, the, the colors are just fantastic. They're really great. Yeah. They're really great. Yeah, so it's, I it's, asked him how he chose one. He said, you know, I went into the Benjamin Morris paint store one day and that color is spoke to me, so that's, yeah. that's the blue one. Yeah. It's nice when there's a wall of color, I know. and you can just I know. grab one and mix it up for you. Um, but yeah, back to that, that initial moment in the studio where that light hit the pile of crushed up canvas, it, it's really all about the light. Mm -hmm. It always has been. So the light, you know, hitting peaks and casting shadows, that's mostly why I stick to one color, because you pick one color, Okay, so that brings me to, there's one I saw on your Instagram that had stripes. So I'm a stripe person, I like stripes, I like lines, I like repetition. And then when you folded the stripes, it brought me to my knees. And I didn't even see the piece in person, I only saw a photo of it. And I was sort of hoping it would be here tonight because that looked amazing. But would you ever consider pursuing that again? Yeah, so pattern is not an idea that I definitely want to play with. Um, I've done a fair amount of them. No one has ever seen them. <laughs> 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 Except for that one. Oh. And unfortunately, I, I hate to break it to you, that piece is no longer in existence. You destroyed it. I cut it up into a bunch of little pieces. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad, I really like that one. <laughs> I like them all, but I thought that was really interesting the way that the stripes just kind of folded down into those crevices. Okay. It's a weird thing about destroying work. I mean, a bunch of my pieces from previous, before this body of work, are gone because I use them as backers for the new work. So some people have pieces in their homes and they don't even know that there's a whole other painting on the back side of them. Like you and Agnes. You know, how she destroyed all of her early work and, yeah, right. and just made it go away. And there are two kinds of artists. One can say, yeah, I don't want the world to see what I consider to be the bad stuff. And then people like me like, oh, I did this in kindergarten. It's special. <laughs> I can't get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good about saving stuff. Well, maybe you should just take a little more. Just a little more. Thank you. Good advice. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Booth, how are you? Good. So, I've never seen one of your paintings that I didn't want to walk into and just absorb into my skin and disappear. I just, there's something about them that, I guess I just like them. I like your work. <laughs> um, I hadn't seen one with the little polka dots over here, bang, and the white one with the little cute little dots. And uh, I just think it's sensational, as, a, as I like as I love 
most of them, but ever since I've known you in your work, I've always felt that when you're painting, you have your own language and almost your own character set that you're, and I know you're communicating with us because I feel it. Um, and I know that you are grid-based because you feel comfortable with grids. You've always done grids. And, oh, there's really good background dirt on Power Booth. When he was younger and living in New York City and had a day job, he was a plumber, a really good plumber. And he worked alongside, or sometimes did jobs with Richard Sarah as plumbers. And, oh, someone else famous that I forget. Um, Phil Glass. Oh, yeah, Phil Glass, also a plumber. And um, I'm not sure that I would ever imagine that that would be your day job. But we all have, I mean, I once picked up hot ice cream cones out of the oven when they were 400 degrees to package them so that you could have them at basket rounds. So we all have, we all have our weird uh, work, work things in our past. And Power was in New York City at the right time, the right place, and he had a bunch of interesting friends, and like Richard Serra and Philip Glass, who was also a native of California. And um, it was also in Colorado at a pretty interesting time when there were a lot of really important people studying there as well. So. Actually, Tom Zetterstrom, who's in the front row here. Tom was uh, in the same class with me at Colorado College. It's amazing that we kept up this friendship for over 50 years <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I went to New York, uh, my first apartment was with Tom. Tom was my roommate. He was going to Pratt, I was going to Wheaton, he was in the Penn State program. And um, uh, the war was raging, and uh, the uh, Otis Redding was raging, and uh, it was Interesting time, 1967. Right? Yeah, I could question that. <laughs> back to the artwork. <laughs> right, that's true. We're back to the I would just jump in and say I'm, um, I, I was sad that I didn't have a story that was as powerful as. Oh, I'm sad about that every day. You know, I, well, as a kid growing up in the suburbs of Northern California, I, I hated it that I just didn't have, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't oppressed, you know. Um, and there was a kind of way that I was uh, distraught about the Vietnam War because that seemed which eventually didn't happen because of a car accident. But I, the, the stress was, uh, and then of course that's the time of uh, the civil rights movement. And um, so politically, both of us were very involved in the politics of our time. It could, you couldn't help but be. Um, but then when I got to New York, it was really interesting to be part of this community of artists that were in theater, in dance, in film, in music, in painting, sculpture. Everybody was in and out of each other's studios. There was a really extraordinary conversation going on that I just happened to be part of that um, included people like Bob Dylan was, you know, just there. Um, John Cage was there. Um, Merce Cunningham. Merce Cunningham. I don't know if you went to the performance, but the transformational performance for me was Merce Cunningham coming through with John Cage and Rashomon in 1963, our freshman year. And, um, and then we went back and met with Rashomon uh, at the art school. And um, it made everything kind of possible, right? And, I had no idea that within a few years I'm actually working 
that the art world was small then and actually quite accessible because there wasn't the money. <laughs> you know, that actually is a great divider, mm -hmm. the, the financial piece. Um, so, you know, so, yeah, Richard and Philip had a film business, and Richard had just thrown his uh, lead into the corners of the Castelli Gallery and became an overnight success. And uh, Philip uh, got a hidden plan to go uh, transcribe Ravi Shankar's music in Paris. And I'm having lunch, breakfast with those guys most mornings at the Tower Cafeteria on West Broadway. <clears throat> and I needed to do some plumbing in my new space, which I just rented, uh, a two-story loft air arrangement, which uh, was um, the outrageous price of a hundred dollars a month. <clears throat> and, uh, and so to get the plumbing materials I had to, uh, I, I agreed to finish their jobs because they were <laughs> not doing any more plumbing. Uh, and then I ended up becoming a plumber for decades. Um, but, but when you were saying, you know, finding time to be in your studio, the truth was Without the studio work, I couldn't have done it. I mean, it's the opposite. You just, you have to get that work. You're not, if you're a painter, you make paintings. So there's no problem with that. So Joe was talking about, he calls it the, the domino effect, that you run into one person and then that puts down, one of the dominoes fall and hits something else. And then that is how, that's how he sees things in life that, oh, a chance meeting, and he met his wife, a chance meeting, and this other thing happens, and a chance meeting, and Judy was his teacher, and a chance meeting, and Paolo was his teacher, and then he got, uh, yeah, but he also got to um, Then he was my assistant. And, oh, yeah, he was your assistant, um, but also the Judy uh, encouraged him to try to do a Hartford Art School, so then that got, that gave you another domino that fell. And so, Howard, you have dominoes that have fallen, you know, in pretty high circles, you know, that you, you knew some of these guys that we all revere and um, and worked among them and touched them, you know, brought Rashford and uh, Richard Serra, and, um, and also that you worked a lot with theater and that you designed a lot of the Things for I can't remember the fu was it fusion. It was no. It was what theater was it? The, the oh, uh, well, my first work was with Richard Foreman, the Ontologic Hysteric Theater. <laughs> if you, it was an extraordinary five years of building props for him. I was actually a designer. Supposedly he was really the designer for his first opera at Tanglewood and then New York. And so it just opened up this whole other world. Of Disciplinary play, you know, and I actually did Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Um, uh, I did about 12 videos. Uh, it was just a hoot to kind of jump in and, and you know, pull a crew together and we just play it. And uh, I don't know, that's what I think art ultimately is is a form of serious. We're professional players. We play hard. Oh my God, that's one word I avoid in my work. I don't ever tell people that I'm playing in my studio. I will always say I'm experimenting or I'm working. I, I'm always worried about using the word play because I don't want people to think that as an artist, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to not diminish it so that people think that I am play. I want them to know that work actually goes into it, but it is true, we play around a lot. <laughs> well, you called my little dots from polka dots. I didn't do a lot of Why aren't they gunshots? No, why aren't they rivets? We all bring our own background <laughs> to the we look at, and oh, yes. I call them polka dots. I apologize. They are dots, they're tiny dots. And um, then you make it these beautiful and mysterious ways. Although the, I see a repeating pattern, which of course I'm a pattern person, and 
and I love repetition, and I love your grid, and I love the way. I want to say we're all pattern people. Mm -hmm. Ah, true. Because we uh, were born, um, and I was listening to Science Friday, or whatever it is, and I, I just thought this is so perfect. This uh, musician was talking about how, well, when you're in the womb, there's a pattern between your heartbeat and your mother's heartbeat. So it's already started. So I feel like an artwork is something that we sync up with. Doesn't matter what it's about, but ultimately you engage it as a non-verbal experience in which there's a kind of syncing up with what the pattern is. And if you can't, you're going to walk off. So really, to me, a work doesn't come alive until you know, there's some kind of thinking between well, the Well, I think another think word you just used was connection. And you have these separate lines, and yet they are placed on a grid. I, I also know that from your process that you, that nothing is as simple as it appears. It's not just gray paint with some blue lines on it, that you paint things and then you spend your life scraping them off and then you repaint things and then you find pieces that you like and then they appear. So there is a lot of process in your work as well. Lots of process. You described painting a painting that took you all night because you couldn't stop because otherwise the the brush strokes would have been different, so you had to stay up all night and work your way from top to bottom, uh, so as not to, because if you didn't finish it, it would have just been nothing. Um, that's process. And repetition. Pattern, color. Um, one of my um, moments of revelation that gave me push into the work I continue to do is reading about Agnes Martin's um, desire to not have any ideas as opposed to having ideas. I felt like in school we're driven to have ideas and I thought, no, this is really, really interesting to find that calm and get the voices out of it. And now open yourself up to what's possible. And that's like what the Buddhists strive for. Just to clear out the thoughts. And be able to just live in silence. And how is that going? <laughs> I'm great. <laughs> you don't have those monkeys chattering in your head? No. No? Very sound sleeper. Uh, ah! <laughs> that's mm -hmm. excellent. So power, where did you where did you start out with your grid? It's it's come along with you. Well, you asked me this question, and I was thinking um, it was a. So I had a really bad car accident, and um, I still have aspects to it. But um, after a year of recovery and getting back. There was a summer I had to spend back in California in a situation that was, I found, utterly depressing. <laughs> and I started just working on the grid. The simplest kinds of forms, and it's never stopped. So that was a summer. I had been in New York for a year, back to California. I wasn't sure if I was going to go back to New York. And in that summer, determining what the hell I'm going to do, I started these just simple shapes and colors. I just wanted to apply it. And, and I think it then I began a habit of drawing every day. And it's taking all other days when um, I don't draw I feel something terribly Wrong has happened. It's it's 
it's just a, um, a uh, practice. You know, I, I don't like the word practice so much. It sounds too much like work. It's, it's just a meditation. So the sketchbooks are just, you know, a few of the sketchbooks. Are those are daily drawings? Could I pick up on the theme that's going on here about the sketchbooks, which intensively and compulsively are about a conversation that Kyle has had with himself. Apparently, billions of them have and endlessly one after another <laughs> at a scale which is 8 by 10 and 12 inches. I'm uh, two of my most cherished possessions are so two little 6 by 6 paladins from the early 70s. And monochrome grays, washes, or etching. And uh, I guess I would, I love the work in those sketchbooks. Actually, more than I love these paintings. Um, and those small paintings, I am able to grasp them at that scale much more entirely in my own conversation. Could you talk a little bit about scale in your work? It's all right. Scale. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, can you talk a little bit about scale in your work? Yeah. Um, so these paintings are six by six. And um, they began this, the scale began in 1968, 69, when I um, was working in that studio that down on West Broadway. And I um, would start them on the sawhorses flat. And um, six feet would allow me to be able to reach in three feet. I could still control the place on the edge. Any bigger I could. And also, um, to get them out on the stairwell, I couldn't get them in bigger. So the number of things determined the six foot. And then I realized on the wall, even though I'm not six feet, <coughs> It felt more human. It felt equivalent. Another body. Another figure. Um, a living creature that has a heart in it, a way of being alive. You know, and that's the measure. Can I bring it to them? Um, sometimes they end up dead. <laughs> and uh, so it isn't about what they look like. It's what they feel like. And since it just feels like it's an equivalent for me. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a challenge to, to manage that kind of space. I think of this drawing I do underneath as a kind of field of play. You've got to play a baseball game, you've got to play out the field, foul lines. And, you know. So, and then the game is to play in that field. And so, uh, I don't want to reinvent the field a lot. The grid is one way. There's this other kind of drawing I've developed, which is a double grid and it's slanted. But I'm not reinventing that drawing. It's, I play it differently. But six feet gives me space to work that out. The smaller ones are more concentrated, and they still have that grid. Um, bigger ones just like play on bigger feet. Does that make any sense? Yeah, sure. And it's the, the size I work with now is two feet, four feet, and six feet. Oh, so you change it up a little. Well, there's this, and they are very different. Those two foot scale, four foot scale, uh, six foot scale. Um, they're different. They're different from beings. So you're not, you're not adhering to just one size bring up Agnes Martin and well, she did not, but she it's did not square. I work with a square because I kind of like the fact that it's neither or it's both a figure and a landscape. It's a figure and a landscape. And then if you repeat that, you have a grid. And if you put it on an angle, flip it, just so you get moving through it. Now you have a dynamic situation that can happen in time. So, 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 tell me on that angle, where did those, where, where did those bullet holes come from? In the polka dots? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where did they come from? Did they just creep in? Or? Well, they mark, um, you know, a transition, you know, to... Yeah. Interesting. And then they have their own repetition. They have their own game in relationship with the lines. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
they're poetic. It's a poetic statement. I mean, <clears throat> you you have a mission, and you don't. Yeah, I can't think my mission uh, or yours. You know, I, but mine was always very.
the play of the curator. It's such a beautiful role, like, and, and the art of the curator. Like, you know, I, I not to, not to to Judy's heart for her, but. Oh, God. The, oh. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if, if, I think a lesser curator would have looked at the three pieces that were, or the three, like, very distinct styles that were represented here and not said to themselves, no, there, there's an interplay that can happen. Um, not just, you know, at the level of, it didn't have to be at the level of the subjective, the, the conversation that we were each individually having with our pieces, but you can take a step back and say there is a relation between form and while my piece has a very distinct idea behind it, um, if you take a step back and just look at the form, the lines, the dots, the, the patterns that, that, that repeat throughout the show, it's, you know, it's kind of wonderful to be able to have that moment. Like, you know, I know when I walked in and the first time it was like, wow, like this is beautiful just from the, the purely aesthetic point of view. The purely step back and like look and see like wow the way that the lights working in the space and the way that the like each piece casts its own impression upon us as the the the, the gallery goer like that's a, a beautiful and artistic statement in and of itself. Like, and if you're not seeing the dots in Jason's work, I'm look on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, from where I am sitting, Jason's room is. These orange dots. There's repetition. There's sort of lines, but they but they're interesting lines. They're not just straight. And then they're framed by these two paintings that have a lot of blue in them. And blue happens to be the complementary color yeah. of orange. And I am just seeing this zing, zing, zing. And then if I look a little bit further down, I'm getting the eye shattering reflection off of, off of those crumpled, fantastic, glossy. There's a connection I make to Jason's work that just hit me when I, because I've been to Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a tradition in the Shinto region of prayers on the little flags, and it just seemed like it was full of prayers. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know, like you. Also, to that, I'm just yes. you might not have done that, but it's a. Would anyone mind if I told my son real quick to stop calling me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Stop calling! Hey, hey we're a hey. little bit hard to stop. <laughs> Alright, talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> It's actually funny that you bring that up because my um, partner is uh, works in international education and is um, their areas of, of work from Japan, Southeast Asia, and China. And one of the things that when we talked about trying to do to, to make to make this a prayer because it was very much in, initially the idea, particularly when we weren't allowing anyone without indigenous heritage into the space, was that it was a place for prayer and prayer. Particularly, prayer made um, you know prayer made material is such an important part of indigenous belief that prayer is not just a thing you say. Prayer is a thing that you you know smoke is prayer, water is prayer, life is prayer in in in, in a degree. So like, I I appreciate you picking up on that because <laughs> it is each each flag is a prayer to to children that have been lost. Just like I hope that each like piece of art in here, in a way, is a meditation on something human, mm -hmm. like base human, like that thing that need to create something to understand this crazy thing that we're all a part of, like that we're all here day to day in life trying to just figure out what it means to, to be alive, to be a piece of a planet that got up and walked around and like started thinking about itself. Well, and we. Um, performed a kind of genocide in, in, in on this continent that we have to be um, feel terrible about because uh, you know even in the 18th century when Europeans were here if if they ran off with the Native American tribe they tended to go back mm -hmm. if. 
Native Americans got caught up in the European world, they didn't want to stick around. <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, we've, we've, we've lost the connection to this, to this planet in our um, pursuit of progress uh, that we are now having to reassess. I guess I'm going to move to a question from Actually, this is a, today. This is a related question to all of it. Um, three points of view to ask. Um, kids, younger people today in the arts, um, many times they're playing video games for years on end. Other times they're watching cartoons to a later age and more TV and more screens. And there's a lot of cartooning because it's a simpler art form because it's only so much can be shown on a screen. It's not as realistic. How do you see those aesthetics? Because, and I'm asking for me, because I haven't been able to share with other artists or find out from other artists how they're seeing the next generation of artists and that simplified form, which is not engaging nature. How do you, each of you see that? I teach right now. I have those students. And well, you were one of them. You came in with your skateboard. I actually can't connect, disconnect your skateboarding from your pieces. Good. There's like a <laughs> relationship there. But I, I, and I guess I have to test. I believe there's an incredible emptiness and hunger for a connection to the world that's more meaningful. I, I, I do not, as you can attest, um, have any interest in technology in my classroom. I have students who want to say, but I draw on a computer. Can I make those? I mean, no, my, you're my assignments. You have to use a pencil and a piece of paper. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, and I feel like uh, uh, we have to get back to touch. Touch. Tactile. Care. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can be distracted. I, God, I, somebody was talking about AI art and how we can make high impact There's a difference between play and making art to entertain us. You know, I mean, uh, play is really serious. And, you know, when you're playing, stuff matters. <laughs> if you're just being entertained, you just, it's popcorn, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's uh, get back to something new. Physical, uh, body, embodied, embedded in something as real as you can handle. So how are people who are in your class, they are, you know, they're stuck with you, so they have to follow your rules, but there are a few generations of younger people out there who are stuck to their screens and addicted to them, but, or it's just the norm. And I well, think... my students resist me. But I think that I, when, I, we're I, gone, I when we're gone, somebody's going to have to come to terms with the fact that this is the new art, that it is... I'm I mean, looking at on screens. Oh, but there, um, there's a hunger for it. I, 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 I am hopeful. I, I am very hopeful. I'm with, uh, with like, I am very hopeful. Um, I tend to be very physical in, in the work I do. Um, a lot of my work requires a physicality. Um, that piece it takes two and a half to three days to just put up, um, you know, because everything's done by hand. But also, you know, I, I have two, I have a teenager, a 17 year old who you all met. And a 12 year old. Um, and they are incredibly connected through their technology to other people. And I, at one point, I thought my son, my 17 year old, was playing a video game. And I got really frustrated with him. I was like, hey, we didn't, you know, survive genocide and do all this stuff just to play video games. And like, I had, I had a real, like, indigenous dad moment with, with this child. And he looked at me and he's like, we're making a movie. And I was like, what do you mean? And he and his friends had been using the video game Roblox to make a movie. Uh, and it, like, they, I watched it, I sat down and I watched it, and it's about as good as like a bunch of high school kids making a movie you would imagine. But I was like, this is incredible. Like you guys were building sets and like designing costumes for your little guys, and your script needs work, but that's okay. And, <laughs> and, and so I am hopeful that, that some, that, someone will come along with, with a bit more genius than I have and be able to figure out how to bridge the gap. 
and how to how to reconnect us, but also bring what may be scary. That bridge may never come. It it may not. I mean, it it, it it may never it may never come. But the hope is that my hope is that that someone smarter than me or someone more talented than me can can find it. And, and sort of like the architect building the dome and or the, building the base for the dome. We don't have the technology today, but in the next hundred years, it will take us to build this church. In a hundred years, somebody will figure it out. Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi did it. So with that, I think we need to wrap up. I would like to thank the three incredible, brilliant personalities who are here with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thanks so much. Okay.